Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and coming here on such a nasty day. We're sort of getting used to this bad weather, I know, so it's snow again. Um, but you'll be very thankful and appreciative that you're here today because we have an incredible guest speaker. And his name is Michael Maynard, and he's the Director of Corporate Communications for Textron, which is headquartered in Providence, Rhode Island. It's a Fortune 500 company that employs over 35,000 people across, I believe, 20, 25 countries around the world. Michael is also a graduate of the University of Rhode Island's graduate program in community planning and development, and he did his undergraduate degree at George Washington University. We'll forgive him for that, but it was, <laughs> it was in political communication. And he's just delighted to, to be here today. We thank him so much also for driving across the whole state to be here to talk to you about his job at Textron, what it means to be director of corporate communications for such a large company, and also his career path of how he got into this position and how he rose through the ranks at Textron so quickly to take on such a prestigious managerial position. Thank you, Michael, for being here. We really look forward to hearing from Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, that's, that's a great introduction. I hope it uh, lives up to its, uh, to its billing, certainly. I remember you know, the first class I ever had at, at, at school as a freshman, it was a class like this, and the professor was walking down the the aisle and she tripped and she fell right on her face. The first, <laughs> first class ever and everyone was just so, no one laughed because everyone was just in shock and I, it was, so I think about that when I walked in, I like, you know, <laughs> steps and didn't want to embarrass myself this way. Maybe by the end I'll be embarrassed but not, not right away. So uh, I think my main goal today is really to give you a, a better understanding of the, the communications function sort of in, in, a, in a broad perspective. And then I'll also narrow it down to, to what I do at Textron uh, in terms of corporate communications. So in my takeaway, really, from today is really that you have a better understanding of, of, of communications as a whole. And that you realize there are a lot of different paths you can take uh, wh and wherever that leads you. Uh, so you, know, you may set out on one, one path and then totally do a zigzag to something else, and, and that's OK, too. But if you have sort of a, a real broad understanding of communications and you, uh, you have the, the real skills, the writing skills, the, the communication skills, the people skills, uh, that can take you in a lot of different directions. So, uh, and also, uh, you'll be hearing throughout, uh, as, I, as I talk, um, how networking and just, you know, taking that extra step and, you know, you, you meet someone uh, and that leads to something else someday. It's, uh, it's sort of, I, I like to say it's who you know, and that sounds really bad, like I know a guy kind of thing. And, but in, in a lot of cases, you know, you know someone and they, they, they see what you can do, and then that leads to something else, and that leads to something else. So uh, I think you'll hear that throughout this talk, too, that you know, never discount uh, taking that extra step, talking to that, that person, doing that extra assignment for, for, your, employ for your employer, for your professor, because uh, you never know where it's going to lead. So when I, uh, as I, I'll, so I'll, I'll sort of... Uh, talk broadly about my career path, uh, and then talk about Textron because I think when I when you hear what I've done, uh, it's sort of a microcosm of, of communications. Uh, it's uh, right now I'm in the corporate world certainly, uh, but I've worked for uh, for a governor, uh, been in journalism for newspapers and magazines, uh, been on a, on a political campaign. So you know all using uh, my communication skills, but in, in different ways and in different environments. And I think you know, you'll have to see, see your path and your personality. It might be, you know, you might love sort of a, you know, I know what I'm going to do every day kind of thing. And that's, that's maybe more the corporate world. You might love, you know, not knowing what's going to happen every day when you go into work. And that might be the political campaign or a PR agency. Um, so, so, you know, I'll sort of weave that throughout uh, when I'm talking about, uh, about, about my, my path. And certainly if you have questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, and, and we can talk about that as well. So when I was in school, um, for, about, for pretty much all, uh, every semester, I worked as an intern for a, um, uh, a Washington uh, news bureau, television news bureau. And I had met, met the, the, uh, the camera crew at a, at a political event and just started talking to them. And, and it worked out to, to have this internship, which was, which was great. I mean, I, college is fantastic. I, I love college. 
but I, I felt that my best experiences really were um, at this internship, at this TV news bureau. So my career path was television news. I, you know, I'm going to be a TV news reporter. I'm going to, uh, you know, be famous, know people in every town. Um, and when I sent around the resume tapes, it just didn't work out. Whether there was a bad tape, bad hair, bad, uh, you know, bad, bad clips, uh, that didn't work out. So I ended up back in Rhode Island. I'm from Rhode Island originally. Uh, working on a political campaign. Uh, a guy was the lieutenant governor running for U.S. Senate. And the political campaigns are a great way to sort of meet people, uh, really start to, to make a name for yourself. I mean, granted, this is right out of college, so it's a very, very low-level kind of job, but you meet, the, you meet people from the media, and then you start to realize what the media wants from the campaign, what we want to tell the media, and sometimes our message that we want to get out isn't going to resonate because something else is happening that day, and they want to know about something that's happening in the news. Uh, we, may, we may want to talk about health care, but someone just announced they want to build a, a, a baseball stadium in, in Providence, so that's, that's the focus. So you have to really um, adjust and adjust your candidate's message, adjust your message to, to the news of the day. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, where we, that's where I started, and it was a great experience uh, you know, working for very little money, but again, at this point, you're trying to make the connection. And we lost the campaign. Um, but through that, I had met some uh, reporters from the Associated Press, the wire service, and was able to parlay those, those relationships into uh, being a stringer. And a stringer being the person they'll, Mike, can you go cover this trial for us? Uh, or go cover this breaking news? And uh, I was fortunate enough to cover a, a, a fairly uh, high profile trial in, in Rhode Island. And uh, from that, was able to get a, jo a, a full-time job in Vermont as a, as a as a reporter at a small paper. Uh, so started at a small paper, then went to a larger paper in in Vermont. And journalism, to me, is is sort of everything that you learn in communications. I think you can learn in journalism because you're learning how to write quickly, how to write accurately, how to deal with with sources, how to how to make sources, and how to how to extract difficult information from people, uh, and then how to accept criticism too, both from your editors uh, when they're when they're reviewing your story, whether it's on television or whether it's it's, it's written, uh, or uh, and then the public, because if you make a mistake or you criticize someone, you're going to hear about it, and you either have to apologize and explain and, and then write the explanation, or you have to stand your ground and say this is why I did it this way, and this is you know this is accurate. You might not like it, but this is this is the way it is. So uh, what a great training. And I, I certainly wouldn't uh, advise any of you to go into newspapers because we're certainly, it's certainly not a growing profession. But, uh, but there are so many different outlets now for media, whether it's you know, golocalprov.com uh, or, or any other of these, these, uh, these outlets, uh, or even at the at, uh, television stations now, you know, political uh, bloggers uh, you know, working for the dot-com sites. Uh, you know, I, I have one uh, friend who is uh, a reporter for for Channel 12 now, and he started out just about seven years ago at a small paper in Attleboro, and he, great, great reporter, went to the Providence Business News. Now, this is Ted Nisi, you might, you might have seen him, and he was able to parlay his, his great work to get a job at Channel 12 uh, on the dot-com side, and because he did such great work, he's now really one of the leading voices in, in political journalism in Rhode Island today, and that's because he really saw a path that he could take. He saw it sort of a specialty. Uh, developed some great sources, and you know, built himself uh, built himself up that way. And if you if you had said to him seven years ago, if I had said to him seven years ago, no, don't don't go work at this newspaper because it's it's a dead end job, he was able to sort of see the bigger picture and and take it further. So uh, a great example of someone who who uh, who loved writing, but also realized that he could take this in a different direction, and and has been very very successful in doing that. So journalism, great you know, great place to start. Uh, went from, so I was in Vermont for about four or five years and realized I thought I, I, thought I wanted something different. And, because uh, it is a, it is tough to do. You know, you're, you're, you're on deadline all the time. And I was doing a lot of writing on government, city government, state government planning. So I decided to get a graduate degree. I thought that would help me, you know, specialize in that kind of writing. So came to URI, uh, Rodman Hall uh, was where I was. And uh, realized pretty quickly that, uh, you know what, I really love communication. Um, but I was in this program, and I decided to, to stick it out. Uh, it's also where I met my wife, you know, now wife, uh, girlfriend at the time. So that was another reason to, to, 
day too, I guess. You know, love conquers all. Always remember that. Uh, so I was. Uh, so I went through the program, and while I was there, I also worked at the Providence Journal, both part time and then full time, uh, uh, while while in school. Because you realize, if you know any reporters, uh, the newspaper reporters especially, they are just they are they're they're irreverent and they're they're really crazy. A lot of them, but they're the funniest, some of the brightest people you'll ever meet. And once you're in that environment, it's hard to to leave. I still consider myself. A, a, a reporter because I, I love the people that are in that in that business because they are just they're just so cynical and and they're just but they're really really funny funny people so it was so had this had this graduate degree and I'm planning and, and was thinking I'd use it in journalism again and my my then fiance got a job in Washington so I moved down to, to DC with her and this started a period where and you you might all go through this period yourselves in, in your lives where I got a job at this agency that did some writing for government uh, government agencies, and it just was not the right fit. And you're just like, you're miserable. Every day, you're like, oh, I have to go to this job. And I didn't like the job, and, and they didn't really like like me, and it just was not a, a good fit. And uh, so knowing that I probably was not going to survive too long because of them, they were probably going to get rid of me, I went to an, uh, an association of landscape architects. That's sort of, now I'm sort of getting closer to where I want to be. You know, writing, uh, starting a newsletter for this Landscape Architecture Association, planning, still not quite where I want to be. Uh, and then went to a magazine that, that really, went, it was called Architecture Magazine in, in DC. And uh, now I'm sort of feeling like I'm, I'm back on track a little bit. But um, uh, that magazine ended up moving to Manhattan, which we did not want to move to. So we came back to Rhode Island and went back to the Providence Journal uh, for about a year. And then you know, it felt grounded again. So I guess when I'm, when I'm, the point I'm making is that for about three or four years, you know, I just felt, I'm, you know, I had, I had my wife. You know, like I said, love. I had love, uh, but, uh, but just professionally, it just felt really, really sort of swirling. So, and uh, if you go through that that period, and you might, uh, just remember that, it, you know, always look for that for that next step. Don't don't feel like okay, I'm. 25 and I'm stuck here and when I'm 50 I'll be doing the same thing. Always think about, you know, what can I do to get me to the next to the next step? And it might it might be in a different profession, it might be somewhere else, but uh, that was a uh, I mean it was I don't want to say miserable, but it was a difficult time. But looking back on it, I can say now, okay, because I, I had I had this job, I realized I'd never want to do this kind of thing again. So I I went in this direction. So just just always and I think that's true with anything. Like you take a class and let's say you're gonna do great in the class. Okay, what you know? Where did it go wrong? Was it uh, you know? If I had done this, would that have been better? If I had done this, always it's always sort of good to to take that that post mortem and look back. We do that in at TechTurn all the time. We finish a campaign, we look back where you know where were the pitfalls? What what could we have done to to avoid that? So just sort of a good a good life lesson, I think. Uh, I mentioned I was now at, back at the Providence Journal as a reporter doing feature stories. Great, you know this is this is this is perfect. But I knew it was going to be a, a temporary thing, even though it was full time. And by the end of 1999, they had cut the position entirely. So that's when I went into the into uh, public relations, uh, a small PR agency outside of Boston. And PR is uh, I'm not sure if there's any PR majors here, but a, a great place to really hone your hone your hone your skills uh, from a communications point of view because. Whether you're at a small firm like I was, it was about maybe 10, 12 people, and we did a lot of uh, work for retail clients. Uh, we had a, uh, a company in, in uh, Montreal that, that uh, made women's jeans. Um, so a chance to really, I'm, I didn't know a lot about women's jeans. Um, <laughs> you can insert your own joke there. But, uh, um, but a chance to really kind of learn about the fashion industry a little bit and go to some of these fashion shows. And, uh, and I, I knew that that wasn't going to be my focus, you know, women's fashion. You know, God bless you if that's what you want to do, but that was not going to be my focus. But we also had some retail clients, uh, you know, a large chain of dry cleaning, cleaning chains, uh, a, a um, company called Agway, which makes uh, farm, uh, farm feed. Uh, so it's a chance to really see a lot of different industries that you wouldn't normally associate yourself with and work on campaigns. And you're so close, at these small agencies, you're so close to the client, you can see, you can see your results. Are you selling more women's jeans? Are you selling more, more feed? Farmers, uh, and it's inter It's 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 uh, especially now. There's so many different uh, you know, programs you can use, Salesforce.com, to kind of measure how you're doing. Uh, so that's that's a that was a great avenue and a great learning because you're you're dealing with the clients, you're dealing with the media. Now I've never worked for a large PR firm, but 
again, another path to take uh, where you can really get in on the ground floor and specialize in, you know, work for a, a, a PR firm that specializes in healthcare or specializes in biotech or tech and develop an expertise in that and, and really, you know, grow your career there. And whether you stay at that PR firm or you, you jump and go to their communications department at, at a, a, a biotech firm or a, a, or a tech firm, uh, you know, now you are sort of the expert and you can bridge the communications with the with that with that specialty. So uh, that was this is at, at this point this is my longest job five years. Um, I realize I'm talking about all these different jobs. You probably think I'm just so unemployable that people keep on getting rid of me or and I'm just I'm just crazy. You know I just keep on leaving jobs. So uh, um, but it's I think that's sort of the way of the world today that you do you do kind of look for what you want to do and and I think there's an expectation that you know you, you're going to take your talents and take them to the to, to the next level, take them somewhere else. Um, but so after five years of this agency, this is in, in Massachusetts, I'm living in Rhode Island. I, I really, what I really missed, and we talked about you know, your personality, what you really like, I missed the, the, the back and forth of being in journalism, being sort of being never knowing what's going to happen next. So uh, again, through, through some contacts, through people I knew, I was able to, to work uh, for the governor uh, at the time, with Governor Kachiri, uh, in, as his director of public information. And this is a, Again, if you if you want to go into work and always kind of you know not know what's going to happen next, a, a great a great job to have to be in government, uh, especially working for an elected official, because you're trying to uh, you know take his message and get it out to your audience, and your audience is the media. I mean, the ultimate audience is the is the voters. Uh, so you know, I uh, I did more of the what we call the offense. I was the public information director, so I. Worked a lot on his on what he what he wanted to get out in terms of you know healthcare reform or uh, or wellness initiatives or uh, uh, you know pension pension types issues. Whereas the the press secretary was the he played defense. So any issue that came up, whether uh, whatever the issue was, what does, what does the governor have to say about that? He was on the on the firing line, and that's a that's a that's a job that is really tough where you have to be accountable for what you know. Say what the governor is, what the governor is thinking. And granted, you're you're you know hopefully meeting with the staff and figuring out what to say. But whatever you say is could be broadcast broadcast uh, you know to everyone. So any any mistake, any any mis misstatement, uh, it's on it's really on you. It's on the governor uh, ultimately. But uh, so that's a job where you really have to think on your feet and you have to be nimble and uh, and really smart about the issues. Uh, you know, throughout throughout the state, and and know, it, you know, you might not know what's going to happen next, and but you have to be ready for it. So, uh, I think you know, and again, the communications as a whole, you should you should have a wide perspective of what's happening in the world, because you never know how that how that is going to impact your day to day job. Um, so, uh, working for the governor was a, was a great job, a very uh, you know tiring job, uh, and knowing that every elected official has a shelf life. Of uh, course, I saw his shelf life coming to an end. He, was, he wouldn't be uh, allowed to run again in 2010, I think it was. Uh, there was an opportunity at Textron uh, to, be, to be with a, uh, a, a large corporation. And I, uh, they were looking for a writer. And I love writing. And again, I saw this as a, maybe a growth opportunity. So I, I left and, and went over to Textron. And I'll give you a little brief uh, synopsis of Textron, and I'll, I'll show you a quick video of some of our products. Uh, so Textron is headquartered in Providence. Uh, as uh, Adam said, it's a Fortune 500 company. I think we're in, in the 230s right now in the Fortune 500. Next month, we'll find out if we go up or down. Not that it matters that much, but it's just kind of fun. Um, and uh, so we don't really make anything at Textron. We are a, what's known as a conglomerate. So we own other companies, and primarily in the aerospace and defense industry. So Cessna Aircraft Company, um, Beechcraft uh, Aircraft, uh, Bell Helicopters, EasyGo Golf Cars, uh, Textron Systems, which, make, which makes a lot of um, military products. Uh, they make armored vehicles. Uh, and then also a uh, fuel tank for, for, uh, for, for automobiles. That's a, a business out of, out of Germany. So we are, the, we are sort of the parent company of this. And I'll quickly show you uh, a video. This is something that we produced last year, and we use this primarily for recruiting. So our recruiters, we're always looking for, for students in 
in engineering, uh, supply chain, finance, even you know communications too, which is that's less of a focus. Uh, but this is a video that we we uh, worked on with our we have a video crew that we work with very closely, and uh, this sort of it's a two and a half minute video. It'll show you sort of the, the, some of the products that that we produce, and uh, the second half of the video is sort of opportunities for for people like yourselves. Sure. Right. So you have characters inside these skills that you yep. need to get a fit and not a right. experience is nothing glamorous. This is what you are now. That's true, yeah. And and you, you leave you don't uh, I never leave a company by burning any bridges as you say, or you know, it's always leaving on very good terms. But uh, networks connected right. more people right. in industry, right. so actually it was organic for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I thank you. I think I feel better about myself now. <laughs> <laughs> I was just drawing <laughs> I suck. That's what I mean. Companies say on your resume, you know, you jump from job to job, but you don't do it because tailored to the job you were actually going to apply for at that time. Right, right. But there was a time when I was talking to a friend of mine in Washington, he was like, Are you moving again? I said, Yeah, it's all good. It's all good, really. It's all good. Okay.
that's um, we just uh, came up with that last year, and we have different variations of, of that based on the recruiters who are out in the in the field out at, at college campuses. Uh, there's some that have interviews uh, with, with you know, quick interviews with uh, with people who work who work at Textron. So uh, that's um, that's sort of a uh, sort of a summary of, of our product. You know, airplanes, golf carts, uh, and that's uh, so. Uh, in, in internal communications at Textron, uh, you know, each, so each of our businesses run separately. Uh, they have their own communications department, and they, they're really more focused on, uh, you know, selling products. So they're working with the media, working with customers. And from Textron corporate point of view, as I said, we're the parent. So we do uh, all the financial reporting happens out of Textron. You know, we're known to Wall Street. We're, we may not be known to you, but uh, we're known to Wall Street. This is where uh, investor relations is, uh, finance, treasury. And corporate communications, uh, we have a uh, sort of a structure where I lead our internal communications team, and we do. Uh, you know, our role really is to is to take the messages from from Textron and get that to all the businesses. So, uh, you know, our CEO has an expectation that people are not going to stay in their jobs forever, uh, like you were saying before. You're always going to grow. You know, we don't want someone sitting in the same job for ten years and saying, "Oh, this is good. I'm comfortable." We want you to get to that next level. So. So how do we do that uh, as communicators? Well, we we've developed a few different channels uh, through uh, through our intranet, uh, which reaches all thirty five thousand employees. We try to get that uh, you know get those messages. We have a, a new channel just for managers. So you know how do we get videos? How do we get something called job aids? You know talking points. Get those to to managers so they they, they have access to this this special channel on on our intranet. Same thing with people who are who are younger who may not have any people reporting to them. We want to give you some career advice. We want to give you tips, uh, you know, ways to talk to your your manager. So, special videos for those people, special uh, articles, things like that. We're really trying to tailor the message to the to these, uh, you know, to our, to our audience. Uh, recruiting is another thing that we do. So, you know, how how what do the what do the kids today want to know? And you know, working with our recruiting team, you know, how can we tailor messages for them? We work a lot with uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, and, and create messages so these recruiters can go out and use those when they're going to be on campus. Uh, and then on the other side of internal communications is just the, the benefits, you know, the health benefits. You know, we we are we uh, control all the uh, all the healthcare benefits for our, our our employees. Not always a great message to deliver, right? You know, costs are always going up, so we try to communicate in, in a very honest way and with with infographics with uh, you know other types of ways that aren't so text heavy uh, about you know why the costs are going up you know you know why they have to go up what you can do to control your own costs that's not really the fun part of the job because it's it's never really delivering good news um, so that's I mean, I'm kind of uh, I want to leave plenty of time for questions but that's sort of what we do at, at uh, in terms of corporate communications uh, role at Textron really uh, again tailoring messages. Uh, finding different channels to deliver these messages, and then always measuring: is it successful? Are, are people reading this? Are people clicking on this? If not, let's go back and, and, and you know, do maybe voice of a customer or do focus groups and figure out how we can how we can uh, how we can better deliver the message. That's uh, I'm going to open up for questions. Uh, if you have any, uh, be glad to, to answer them. Uh, and then uh, you know, move, move on from there. Should one aim to move up in an industry? Like, could you provide us some tips? Because I know that you you kind of moved uh, up forward um, through all these different experiences and jobs, but in this one particular career path. At Textron, can yeah. you repeat the question to everyone? So you're, you're saying how can how long should you expect to stay at a certain yeah at level? level before moving forward? And then what tips could you provide us with how to move forward in you know less time? Sure. Um, you know, I really I think it really depends on. Every company is a little bit different, but I think you know you spend about six months or maybe a year uh, in a certain role, and I think you're always you're always sort of looking for that next that next that next step in, in that company, uh, modeling yourself after what other people are doing. You see what what people are doing that's good. You see what people are doing that that isn't good. Uh, but I, I you know so it really varies. I was in my first writer position role for about a year, and then uh, we actually had some, some major cuts because of the economy. So I was actually able to move up. Uh, and, and get a better and, and you know, become a man.
manager, and then after a couple of years, will become the director of the communication. So I think you're always kind of not that you want to step over, step on anyone to get ahead, but always looking, you know, where, where's, you know, where's this person look like he or she might need some help, and you know, maybe I can say, hey, you know, can I help you with this project? And if you get yourself, you know, even on like a cross-functional team where you're working with someone in IT, you're working with someone in finance, you're you're getting your name out there, like I was saying before about making contacts, right? I mean, even within your own company, you can always make contacts, and you know, all of a sudden you become known as sort of the go-to person, and boy, she can really get the job done. Someone else hears about you, uh, so I, I don't think you can necessarily you know say I'm going to be in this job for this this long and then I'm going to move on. But but I'd say you know within six months a year you start to at least start thinking about you know what's what's next. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go, yeah. Um, how important is face to face communication in your company, and uh, do you send employees on business trips for meetings, or do you prefer video conferencing? Face to face is still really important. Uh, you know, you can only, I think we're so used to now to, to, to emailing someone, and uh, that's a lot easier a lot of times to say, this is sort of a difficult conversation, so I'm just going to email, and then it's back and forth and back and forth, and then who knows what, what you were talking about in the first place. So um, what we try to do a lot of, and it's not always easy, is, is, is do the face-to-face -face meeting. A quick, even what we call a stand-up meeting. So can we meet for 10 minutes, and we're not even going to sit down, let's just, um, you know, let's not even stand Maybe you know, like even the desk is a barrier right now. So like, it's just all these little psychological things. So like, you know, stand over here and, and talk rather than stand, uh, uh, you know, having something in between that, that creates that barrier. So we, we do a lot more face-to-face -face meetings than, than we used to because uh, it just it gets things done a lot faster. And then in terms of business trips, we don't really. If you asked me seven years ago, I'd say yes. I mean, people are traveling everywhere. I mean, just the corporate expenses are just. <coughs> Champagne and well, not champagne, but it was just like you know, just you know, you could go. I want to go here, go fine. But you know, since the downsizing, and we've downsized a lot, um, a lot more is done now through um, we don't use Skype that much, but we use um, a lot of the video uh, conferencing. We use something called Microsoft Link, uh, which, which uh, is a way to, to, to chat uh, in real time. So, um, we look, I encourage my team to go on to go on professional conferences. Uh, so City for something in April, and we do have a budget for that because it's it is important to, to to not network with just your own colleagues, but to you know to have that wider view. Uh, International Association of Business Communicators is a, is a great organization. They have a lot of jobs. I was just helping an intern uh, two days ago. IABC.org or .com has a lot of great jobs out there, and they have some good conferences. PRSA uh, has 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 a job board too. So um, so when you meet these people from these organizations. It's, so I, we do do some, but not as much as we used to. You said that you had an internship with an undergraduate who's just stuck in mm -hmm. multiple semesters. A lot of us are in the process of getting internships, or we already have one. What advice would you give? Would you say that it's more beneficial to stick with one internship and like build a relationship with that company, or do you think it's better to jump around in your undergrad years? You know, different places? That's, that's a it, that's a good question. I think it, it varies. If if you feel like you're at an internship and you're actually contributing a lot to it, and you're you're going to grow in that. Uh, we have in, we we had two interns every semester, including the summer, and um, we, we started last year actually paying them. So we had two interns last last fall. They were so good that we we had them this semester, and we, we're giving them more responsibility. So if you think you can get more responsibility at this internship, take it, especially if it's a, if it's in a, a, an industry or a company you think there might be some potential for full time employment. But if, if it's I like it. It's not great. Do I have a chance to do something else at this company? I certainly jump at that. So I think it's really, it's, I, I, it, listen to your gut a lot of times, right? If you, if you feel like it's right, then I, I stick with that. Okay. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. So I know that you, um, you said that with, uh, you know, communication and journalism and anything. Just what are some of the difficulties in um, transitioning between uh, job and journalism and Oh, that's, that's a very good question. Can you repeat the question? Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the difficulty of trans transitioning, transitioning, of saying the word transition, between uh, <laughs> journalism and, and PR. And uh, uh, part of it is, uh, I think a lot of people who go from journalism to PR feel this way. I know I did. You know, when you're in journalism, you're sort of on the side of, of God. 
you know, like truth and, and justice and, you know, you're, it's a, you could be a little arrogant, actually, because you're, you think, you know, I am, this is the way it's going to, you know, I'm, I'm speaking truth. And when you're in PR, you're, you're trying to tell that journalist, your former self, uh, you know, I have this great product and it's, you know, you really should do a story on it and uh, you know, can I send you a sample? And you, it, there, there's a little bit of that. I mean, you have to recognize that you, you are now in PR, you're working for a, a, a customer, a client. When you're in journalism, you're working, you're working for the public, sort, you know, sort of. Like it, it, that sounds a little self-serving, but, you know, you, you're working for, 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 for truth. So, so that's, that's one of the things you have, I had to get my, my head around. They call it going to the dark side. We hear that a, a lot. Um, but also, just um, in, in communications, there's a process. All of a sudden, you have to, you know, you have an idea. You have to go to your, you have to go to your account manager. You have to go to the customer. You have to go. There's a lot more steps involved. Whereas in journalism, it's get the story, you know, go through the editing process, and, and you're you're done. So it's it's uh, there, you have to have a little more patience. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, it's very rewarding. You do, you, you do some. You know, you do. You're, you're helping someone, you know, someone's business, uh, and, and or, or you're communicating an idea that's getting out there. So, so that's that was probably the big. Those are probably the two biggest things: the process and just the psychological part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how important do you think it is to on the path towards success fail or find yourself, and have you learned more from your failures than your success? I, th I think so. I mean, if you asked me at the time, I'd, I'd say, "Oh yeah, I'm sorry." Uh, you know, what do you learn more from your failures, failures than your successes? I think you learn a lot from your successes too. But uh, certainly, when you do something and it doesn't work, you know, you have to reevaluate. I think I said that earlier. You have to just okay, step back and say, "What did what did I do wrong? What did someone else do wrong? Uh, and how can I not how can I avoid that next time?" So every experience at the time might not be a good one, but but when you look back at the totality. Of college career, you know, you look back and say, okay, I, I at least learned from this, and uh, and hopefully, you know, so you don't make that mistake again, but there's always, there's learnings, I think, in, in everything that you do, uh, and, but, but, and same thing with success, you know, you know this went really well, uh, but I think you can learn from that, too, you know, what could you have done even better, uh, so it, feels, it certainly feels better to, be successful, to have success, yeah. Um, how do you keep such a tight-knit communication with such a large uh, how do you keep? See, I'm, I'm learning from my failures. I'm not repeating the question. <laughs> how do you? What was the question? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> what was, uh, how do you keep such a tight knit? Uh, how do you? Don't, don't, don't I got it? I got it. <laughs> how do you? How do you? Um, uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you lost how do you me. communicate with all your employees in such a large company? Are there like smaller departments or? Oh, okay. So yeah, how do you communicate with such a large population? We're talking thirty-five thousand people, and how do you? Get that message message to them. We, as I mentioned, we have our businesses, and they each have they have communication teams, and, and their primary focus is, you know, external, getting getting the messages out to, to customers and to, to the media. But we work with them too. Um, so, so let's say we're, you know, our our CEO, you know, he really wants to talk about, you know, talent development. So we will infuse that in our in our intranet, you know, which is called Eric, uh, and we will, you know, put those messages on Eric. Everyone in the company sees it, uh, and, and, and again, we're, we're we're specializing in these different channels: the, the manager channel, the uh, the individual distributor channel. So, uh, so that's so that's one way we're sort of you know targeting these different these different people, and then we're also giving all these messages to our business unit, and then they have different ways of doing it too. They might they maybe they're they're reaching out to their uh, their employees through through posters or through uh, through face to face meetings with their with their leaders. So. So we're trying to, so we're communicating a big message, uh, channeling it, and then giving it to our business unit communicators who are, who are making it even, uh, distilling it even, even further down. And one, one thing I want to mention is uh, you know, there are about 15,000 people who are, we call them non-network employees. So they, they, are, they work on the shop floor. They're the ones making the helicopters, making the, the golf cars. And they don't have access to a, they don't sit at a computer all day. Uh, they have to either go to a kiosk or, they can log in at home. We have a, a, a system for logging at home. It's a very, it's a very complicated system. This year, our big initiative is to reach those non-network people because we don't want them to feel like they're sort of left out of, of, 
of all the messages too. Uh, we're relying on their supervisors to get new messages now. So we have a campaign to, to unify unify that that group of people as well. Uh, yes. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say I love the golf carts, the easy go golf carts. They're yeah. so much better than gas. They're the electric ones, right? We we make both. So well, the, I love the electric ones. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> my question is. In communications, I never hear any students talking about wanting to go into a sales occupation or something like that. And I'm in public relations right now, and yeah. I feel like you you learn a lot that can benefit you in that kind of field. So, mm -hmm. someone over there was saying before that, you know, how does the uh, video conferencing and e like media yeah. kind of stuff? How does that all connect to your personal communication line? How is the how is the sales force changing? How how are they changing? Are they still going on business trips and everything, or is it more video conferencing and emailing and yes. just not as much face to face interaction with the employee? That's that's an uh, interesting question. So how does the how is the sales force, sales force changing? Uh, they still they they're still they're still out there because in sales it really is all about the customer. So they are out there. Uh, Actually, we are actually increasing our sales, our, our local sales forces. You know, we, we sell things all around the world, and a lot of time, the, the, the trend had been to, um, to to outsource, to use third third party sales sales uh, people, so sales party reps, I think they call them. So you know, they might they might try to sell a Cessna plane, but if they can sell a a, a Learjet, they'll sell that too. Whatever they can make more money. We we found that you know you have to be you have to be in that local community. So so we have a big presence. East right now because that's where a lot of sales are taking place. So we're we're beefing up our sales, especially on the aerospace side. Uh, you know, golf. You mentioned golf. That's that's actually sort of a dying. Uh, it's 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 a it's a shrinking industry in most places. But like in Asia, it's still a very it's a it's a big market. So we have more sales people now in Asia. Uh, you know, making those those local connections face to face. So yeah, that that hasn't changed at all. That's actually increasing. You know, that's that nothing's changed with that. Tailoring your messages. How do you tailor your message to your employees and companies in other countries? That uh, for, for that, that's a, uh, how do we tailor our message to employees in other countries? Uh, we do a lot. Uh, so our other countries are uh, uh, the biggest one would be Germany. Uh, Tautex, as you may have seen, uh, they make uh, plastic fuel cans. So they are in, they're in Germany. Uh, and we work very closely with, with our German counterparts there to, so here's our, here's our message about talent development, for example. Uh, they'll, they'll take that and they'll, they'll tweak it, uh, you know, not just, not just translation-wise, but, but culturally. You know, so they'll, they'll change it around for that audience. Uh, China, we have a China office with uh, two communications people in China, and same thing. You know, here's our message, we'll, we'll, we'll get on the phone with them and share it, and then they'll say, okay, is it okay if we take it and now we're going to say this? And, and you know, we're generally fine with that. So, yeah, that's, that's a great point that, um, you know, as, as I was talking to the wider world, uh, you know, there are certain things we don't do in certain countries or, or say. Uh, you know, Mexico, we found, is you know, very family-oriented, so there's a lot of family gatherings uh, at our Mexican facilities. So, so a lot of the, the messaging that goes out around safety, for example, in Mexico is about, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, your family wants to see you home safe every night. Um, and I hope that's true in the United States too, but I think that's even more true in Mexico. Uh, so so the messages are tailored a little bit towards that community. So that's a great point. It's, but I think, that, again, to, to having um, having the local presence, you know, we, you know, me in Providence, you know, telling the people in Germany how to say something is not going to fly. So, so we do work very closely with them. Uh, yeah, and then we'll go to people. media and like reaching out to you know younger audiences how like what are the purposes of those messages like what's the message you're trying to get to younger audiences on social media uh but we you know it's, we have so how do we get our messages up on social media uh to younger audiences and what we uh primarily it's, it's our, around recruiting so we we target different schools around the country uh where we're where we have businesses primarily so it's just you know uh, what we call the value proposition. It's not something we would say to them because that's such a corporate phrase, value proposition, but it's we, we try to tailor the message to, to people like, like you. Why, you know, 
the, the, the benefits of working for TechStone. You get to be getting on the ground floor of the company. It's a growing company. Uh, there's opportunities for you to grow throughout your career at TechStone. There's opportunities to move, so you can start at Bell Helicopter. But there's a great position uh, at Cessna uh, that is going to take you to somewhere else. So we know that you know that you know people want to want to grow uh, in their career. I mean that's true with everyone, but especially you guys. You know, you, I think you all have a bad reputation. You know, you, you twenty somethings that you know you, you know you're never you're never satisfied with anything. There's always something better. There's, there's, and and we're trying to say you know yes you know we know that there's different ways you can move uh, around the country around the world. Um, so that's sort of our our value proposition that. Come here, and you know the world is always your oyster place. Yeah. You were saying, um, obviously, about messages in other countries on social media and everything like that. Um, as the director of corporate communications, are you overseeing those messages or like press releases, things like that, at all times? Not uh, so. Am I overseeing more the, the press releases? No. Yeah. Do I oversee everything? And the answer is no. We um, uh, so any business that has a press release. Uh, it, it, this is actually a pretty good point. Uh, it has to come to corporate communications because since we are a publicly traded company, anything we say publicly could could potentially be what they call market moving. So if we announce a sale that we're going to, if we announce uh, a deal to sell 200 helicopters to to um, to a company, which we I think we just announced. Uh, hopefully, we just announced that because I just told you that. Um, <laughs> but that was, it, it's something that it goes through what's called a press release approval cycle. So it comes to corporate. Uh, I have a counterpart who does external communications, so he'll look at that. Legal will look at it. Finance will look at it, and investor relations will look at it and sign off on it or say, you know, this this word has to be changed to May or this. Or so um, so I don't really get. In, I, so we'll look at it from just a communications point of view if it looks okay. Uh, in terms of the other messaging, yes, I will. I will sort of over, make sure that in any internal messaging, uh, you know, again, we work very closely with our with our HR partners and uh, with our talent development people. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we we'll all agree on something. It's it's really pretty collaborative. And once we can all uh, sign off on it and not hate each other too much, and uh, then we'll you know we'll, we'll do it. So I I'm more internal. We have an external guy too. Um, I think you had a question. Right? Um, you stated multiple. Um, networking is a very important factor, but for those who are more introverted and struggle with networking, is there any advice that you can give them? Yeah, you know, and I, I actually mentioned that. So any advice for people who might be, be more introverted about networking? And I meant to actually say that at the beginning because I consider myself sort of a introvert myself. I'm not a type of guy where it's like, how you doing? You know, that kind of where you're just like out there. It's just, I think uh, when I say networking, I think, you know, for, for someone that might be a little more shy is, you know, if you get an internship, uh, you know, let your actions speak for you. Uh, so, you know, you do great work. You ask your supervisor, what else can I do? Or, you know, is, 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 could we do this? Uh, you know, I, like I said, we have two interns every semester, and they're always, some of them are always coming up to me and saying, what can, you know, have you thought about this? And a lot of times it's, you know, no, because <laughs> you can't do it that way. But the fact that they're thinking about it really impresses me. The fact that they're, they're actually kind of thinking big, big picture is great. Uh, and, uh, and that may lead to other productive conversations. So I think if you, know, if, uh, if you don't have an internship yet or you don't have a, a, a job, I think it's just, it, even if it's approaching someone after, after a lecture or after, uh, or, or you know, seeing someone uh, who has another, a peer who has an internship, you know, you know how'd you get that? You know, just sort of with that one-on-one -on -one stuff. Communication in the workplace. If we stick with thinking about internal communication, what are the do's and don'ts of personal communication at Textron internally? You say personal communication. Means Social media, personal email, blogging, blogging for personally blog, uh, personally blogging. Uh, there is a. I mean, I think every company now has a social media media policy where uh, you know you're you're free to do what you want to do on your own personal computer, but certainly. Work computer for, for, uh, for, for, for blogging, uh, and you know, I don't, I don't think we monitor people's blogs. Uh, I, I hope, I, I hope we don't do that. I don't have a blog, so I'm, 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 I'm clear. Whatever happens, uh, but um, <laughs> I, uh, but you know, I, I think you have to be very, very careful uh, about what you, what you blog as a, as a 
text on the story. Certainly, you wouldn't blog anything constantly internal. Uh, that would certainly you know, get you to lose your job pretty quickly. Um, but I think it's just uh, just being very careful about what you what you do. Uh, and certainly, there's I mean, we all use our computers for you know you know send my wife an email uh, or but I certainly would never send any any jokes uh, to anyone uh, whether or not they're I, was, I wouldn't send any offensive jokes anyway, but uh, I wouldn't send any 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 jokes to to, uh, to, to family friends on, from my email account just because uh, you just never know when it's going to come back and bite you. Uh, so that's something that we're you know is, is is a growing concern. There was something in the in the um, and I don't know if I is it real okay. Know. There was a, something in, in the New York Times Magazine a couple of weeks ago yeah. that was did you see that about this woman who, who went on a plane to South Africa and yeah. she she. She tweeted three things, and she only had like 179 followers. And by the time she landed in South Africa, there was someone taking her picture because it was she sent something very offensive. And she thought it was just an inside joke, and she lost her job. She's yeah, a something like, "I hope I don't get AIDS or something." Right, right. But, but I'm like, "Don't worry about that." Right. Right. And she was director of corporate communications, actually. Um, and by the time she got off, there were all these hate groups, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Twitter and Facebook. When it's just demanding, uh, and she lost her job. Yeah, it ruined your life. So, uh, you know, I, uh, so it's, it is. It's uh, some, something to think about, isn't it? That just you never know. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, social media is so great, but it's also uh, so deadly too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. How has your background in different communications fields helped you in your career now? Um, so, how has my my varied background helped me now? I think probably the, the the, the most concrete way is, as I mentioned, I, I was hired in 2007 as a uh, senior writer for, for, our, for our intranet. And within a year, we had about 20 people on our staff at the time. Uh, the, the financial crisis happened, you know, companies were imploding, were, were going bankrupt. We, we had to cut half our staff. So we went from 20 to about 11. I was kept on, I was only there for a year, but I was kept on because I had the external experience of you know, being a, you know, working with the governor no one had to look at the media. I had some video experience, I had some PR experience. I had I had enough, I knew enough about enough different things where they said, okay, we, we better keep this guy because he can help us do different things. So I think the more varied your background is, a lot of times that can, you know, that, that can really, that, that certainly helped me. So uh, that, that was, there's a, a, a great example. And then, and then just, you know, knowing how to work with, how to read different people, I think, I don't know, I think that's a skill that you learn over the years too. Uh, not kiss up to people, uh, you know. Although you have to learn that sooner, but uh, <laughs> but um, but you know, knowing how to manage up. So you know, knowing knowing that if you help your boss make her look good or make him look good, you're gonna you know you're gonna look good too. Uh, and again, there is a, there is that line you can tell when people are fawning, and you know uh, that's that's that that actually can be a deterrent sometimes because uh, I think even your boss knows when. All right, stop. You know, stop it. <laughs> Uh, so, I, but I think if, if you can if you can make you know, make your superiors look good, uh, that's another that's another that's, that has helped as well. I think we have time for one more question. Yep. Um, what has caused companies to much larger companies? How have you formed relationships with people, and how do you stand out? So how do you go, you go from a small company, which it's you know you and ten people, to a large company? How do you form relationships and stand out? And really, it's 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 based on on you know you, you work on different projects. So, you know, you're you're working on a project with a, uh, a guy from finance and a woman from treasury and a person from IT. Uh, so then now you have one network of people, and it's really just uh, you, you're not going to form that. You're not going to stand out within five months, six months. It's going to take a year. It's going to take a couple of years really <laughs> before you're really developing that that strong network. We have a woman who's just, she's actually graduating this May from Roger Williams. She actually, she finished her classes in December. She was an intern last summer for us. And I, I, I told her, uh, she's now full time with us, you know, that it's it's going to happen. You know, you know, don't worry that you're, you know, you're still making friends, that, that text run really, because, you know, as you work on more projects, you're going to get to know more people. You're really going to develop your network that way. So it's, 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 a, it's a gradual thing, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's going to happen, but it's just going to take time. I don't have any cards with me, uh, but if, 
I, my email is uh, first, first initial, last name, so M Maynard, M M A Y N A R D, at textrop.com. If you have any follow up questions or any, anything, feel free. I'm you know, glad to, to, to help out. Michael, thank you so much thank for you. your very yeah, uh, informative talk. Thank you for sharing your sure. experiences and career path. And we have a small gift for you as well. We appreciate so much you coming uh, all the way from Warwick yeah. here in a snowstorm <laughs> to join us and for sharing knowledge about your company uh, with us. And so we have a beautiful oh. University of Rhode Island portfolio okay. for you so you can continue your habit of writing well thank and you. good. <laughs> and of course, we want every alum to dress warmly in this yeah. weather oh. so we have a great URI sweatshirt for you as well. St. Joe's game on Saturday. <laughs> great. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Alfred.